Uh, Tuesday night at prayer meeting, we're going to focus on CareNet, and we're going to bring some of the staff, and we pray over them, and they share their hearts, and it's great. Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. We were at national convention, and uh, one of the fellowship uh, churches has a young mom. She has three little ones. Her and her husband have three little ones. And uh, the second one, a little girl, a little feisty two-year-old named Fiona. And she's got an infant too. And so uh, Fiona kind of gets in trouble a lot. And so mom is having to confront Fiona. And she sits her down and Fiona has done something naughty and, and she's, she's trying to parent and get Fiona to own what she has done. And she said, did you do it, Fiona? And Fiona looks at her and says this, the answer is not no. <laughs> Could we stand together in honor of God's word? We have been going through the book of Luke and we just have a very special message today, I believe. Of course, if I don't believe it's special, probably no one else will. (laughs) So Luke chapter seven, it's kind of a long passage, so gear up. Soon afterwards, verse 11, soon afterwards he, Jesus, went to a city called Nain. And his disciples were going along with him accompanied by a large crowd. Now as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow And a sizable crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, do not weep. And he came up and touched the coffin and the bearers came to a halt. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. The dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Fear gripped them all. And they began glorifying God saying, A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And then in verse 36, now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table, and there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. A moneylender had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one who he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged correctly. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, and she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, Your sins have been forgiven. 
Those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Soon afterwards, he began going around from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who were contributing to their support out of their private means. Could we pray, please? Lord, I pray that you would speak and move in our midst today. Lord, I, I, really, I really feel like you want to encounter us today in a very special way through preaching, but also through your direct touch. Please, God, please do everything you want to do here. Protect this place and let it be a safe place to experience you this morning, I pray. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. You may be seated. I've just titled the message today, Loving Much. How do you love much? And point one is by receiving God's love. To love much, to love God much, does not start with you loving God. It starts with you receiving God's love. 1 John 4, 18 says that this is love, or, or we love because he first loved us. So loving God is actually a response to his loving you. 1 John 4, 16, just a few verses earlier, John says this, we have come to know and believe the love which God has for us. The impression is, is this wasn't a done deal right away. We have, sometimes it's hard, things happen in this life and you wonder, does God really love me? This woman had had her husband die. She's a widow. Does God really love me? And John says, we have come to know, and that word know is experientially know and believe the love God has for us. This is the, until this question mark about does God love me because, becomes an exclamation point, God really loves me. It is almost impossible to to grow. It's imp almost impossible to really love God when you're not really sure whether he loves you. How do you receive God's love first by believing God's heart for you? Jesus cares about the brokenhearted and the vulnerable. Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Jesus feels compassion for people. He is walking along. He sees the funeral procession. He knows this woman. He knows that she's already lost her husband. This is her only son. And she is weeping as, as the funeral procession goes along. And Jesus is moved. Did you know that God is moved by our stuff, by our troubles, by our pain, by our issues? This is one of the only, there are a few others, this is one of the few in Scripture where nobody asks Jesus to do a miracle. Usually it's always, they ask him, they press through the crowd to ask or touch, or this is, Jesus himself initiates this. He is close to the brokenhearted. Last Sunday night, we had a, a young preacher, and we have emphasized all along that young just means young to preaching, not, not necessarily 
um, young in age and one of our young preachers, she's given me permission to share her name and tell her story is uh, Ellie, Ellie Saboka. She gave a message called Orphan or Heir. She told us the story. She said, it's been a great few months for me. And she said, it started on March 3rd when I slipped on the ice and I broke both wrists and fractured a vertebrae in my back and dislocated other vertebrae in my back. Okay, we're all feeling at this point of the story that she might be a little insane because she started with how great this last couple of months were and now we've got this tragic accident on the ice. And she was kind of holed up by herself and God took something very, very difficult and he used it to speak to her. He took her to John chapter 14, verse 18. Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And Ellie, very strong Christian for many years, knows the word of God. God started speaking to her about an orphan spirit in her identity. Jesus doesn't leave us as orphans, but we can stay there. We can stay somewhere if we don't agree with Jesus, if we don't agree with his purpose and what he's done, we can, we can stay there. Certainly not in her mind. She knew all of the promises and had mem scriptures memorized, but in their, her deepest identity, there was still an orphan spirit marked by rejection, marked by fear and insecurity, and marked by loneliness. And Jesus said, I, I'm going to use this time to pour my love out on you. I'm changing your identity. I'm changing you from orphan to heir. And she said these months had been God filling her up and speaking to her and fear leaving and loneliness leaving and God taking her in a very deep place to be his favored daughter, even though she couldn't even stand up with a, without excruciating pain because of her back. She had casts on, on both wrists. So Easter Sunday came. It's a month later. And she says to her husband, Tony, Tony, I, I, I want to go to church. Please get me dressed. I want to go to church. I want to be there for Easter Sunday. And so they are on their way to church. And while they're driving, she has this picture of the woman with the issue of blood pressing through the crowds to touch the hem of Jesus' garment. She takes it as a promise that God wants to touch her today. So they get to church, they sit in back, she is in so much pain that Tony turns to her halfway through the service and says, honey, do you, want, do you want to leave now? She says, no, I am not leaving. And in that message, I had told a story of, about a, a, a woman, a, a mom in Belize who uh, her mom had touched her back and she was instantaneously healed while I was down there. She just took that as God is going to touch my back. And so after the service was over, we have ministry teams up here and she came to the front and sat in the front row there and I was up here praying with my daughter, Christina. We were praying for her. She said, you must have prayed for 20 people. And I'm just in the front row and I'm just praying along with each of the 20. And finally, I come over to her and I ask her what's going on and she, she shares the story a short version of it, and I said, do you want to be prayed for sitting down or standing up? And she said, 
I didn't, I don't know why I said it because standing put me in excruciating pain, but it came out of my mouth. I said, standing up. And when she stands to her feet, God instantaneously heals her back. Sometimes when I pray for people, I'll ask them to tell me their pain level so that we can know whether there's a miracle. I'm like, well, tell me, tell me your pain level. <laughs> and she's like, she said, I don't have any pain on my back. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, let's pray for the wrists. Um, that, here's the funny thing. The only thing that didn't get instantaneously healed was what I prayed for. <laughs> Jesus healed her back. The wrists are getting better and better, but they're not completely healed yet. Which is the greater healing? To come into your inheritance as a favored daughter or a favored son or to have something physical be touched. I think the inward is more important than the outward, but in this situation, the outward certainly served as a confirmation of the inward. God loves his people. This woman, I think she was a, a Jewish woman. I think she read the Bible. I think she believed that God loved her because the word of God said it, but things happen. Her husband was lost. We don't know how he died, but she is a widow. And then something else happens where Jesus raises her son from the dead. I just have a feeling that she never doubted again the love that God had for her, the love that God has for human beings. How do you receive God's love, believing God's heart for you, and then secondly, receiving God's forgiveness for you? This woman that comes and weeps over Jesus' feet and is pouring this perfume, uh, all we know about her for sure is that she is a, she's known as a sinner. She's known as uh, some commentators because Mary Magdalene is mentioned right away in, in uh, Luke 8, 1, think it was Mary Magdalene who had, who had had seven demons cast out of her and and. and, and the, the enemy can only get on people that are already choosing lies and choosing and, and he has tried to destroy Mary Magdalene's life. And Jesus has forgiven her and set her free and given her a new beginning. The Bible says that she who was forgiven much loved much. Matthew 12, 31, any sin, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people. This is astonishing. Whatever sin you've committed, whatever blasphemy you have committed, Jesus came to die for it to, so he could forgive you and give you a new beginning and break darkness's hold and darkness's plan over your life. This is how God feels about you. This morning, one of our prophetic women got a word and she brought it up to Greg just as Greg was coming up and so Greg didn't get it. She was just about to give it to him and so she gave it to me and said, could, could we read this? And I'm like, I'm gonna read this during the message. So let me, this, this is a prophetic word from, from today. I saw a very large whiteboard with negative words of identity written in permanent marker. Words like sinner, worthless, rejected, alcoholic, unclean, pothead, wife beater, and on and on. People tried to wipe the words away and even hide it. 
but the words remained. Then a hand with a large pad dipped in Jesus' blood wiped away the words in one swipe, and not a trace remained. New words appeared, forgiven, accepted, loved, gentle, kind, peaceful, free, all opposite of the original words. Jesus has changed everything. Pastor Tom, it seems like in this passage that the only way you're really going to love God a lot is if you committed just a ton of sins. You're going to, you're going to love better if you sin more because then you got to be forgiven more and then you can love more and (laughs) this is, it's really a matter of seeing your sin. So let's look at Simon's sin. Let's look at the Pharisees' sin for a moment. Uh, We just said all manner of sin, all blasphemy, all of it will be forgiven. But there is one sin that can't be forgiven. That's called an unconfessed sin. A sin that we don't own, that it was really sin. A a sin that we create self-righteousness around ourselves. Jesus said this um, in John 9, 41. He said, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say we see, your sin remains. Let's look at Simon's sin. He says this about Jesus. He's mumbling it in his thoughts. If, if, if he was really a prophet, he would know what sort of person she is. Um, the NIV says what type of person she is. Well, Jesus doesn't know what type of person she is or what sort of person she is. And let me tell you why. Jesus doesn't see types of people. He doesn't, he doesn't put people in categories with prejudice and say, this is this type of person and this is this type of person. And when he looks at you, he doesn't think of you as you're this type of person. Jesus doesn't see types. He sees people. He sees through all of the prejudice and labels of human beings. And he sees what's really going on in the heart. The one who knows you the best. And the Bible says there's nothing that is hidden from his sight. There's no thought. There's no word. There's no desire. Nothing is hidden from his sight. The one who knows you the best loves you the most. God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But Simon, as a Pharisee, neatly has the human race in little types and sorts. And of course, he's got himself in this category called righteous. He thinks of himself as a a good person, even though he's filled with prejudice. Hmm. A guy came to uh, John Wesley, an atheist. John Wesley's the founder of the Methodist Church. He was a burning, shining lamp in the 1700s. And this man came to John Wesley and, and said, uh, uh, Sir, I, uh, I don't believe in God, but I, I, I question you. you. You say that we're all sinners. He said, I'm not a sinner, I, d- I don't sin. I have nothing to be forgiven of. John Wesley said, well, he said, uh, do you love God? He said, well, no, I don't even believe in God. When John Wesley said, well, The Bible says that the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Sir, if you break the greatest command, then you are the greatest sinner. 
And it sounds to me like you've been breaking it every single day. You know, mountains don't seem very big when you're a long way from them. In fact, you seem fairly big in relationship to the mountain. When, you're, when there are hundreds of miles away and you could just see them, they don't, they don't seem that awesome and you seem kind of big. But there's something that changes, isn't there, when you get really close to a mountain. The mountain becomes awesome and you become very small in your own sight. For the first five chapters of Isaiah, Isaiah, who's a, who's a righteous man, who's a godly man, he's a prophet of God, he's telling Israel how sinful they are for five chapters. And something happens in chapter 6, verse 1. It's in the year that King Uzziah dies. He's been prophesying during Uzziah's reign. The, the Bible says that he saw a vision of God. He saw the Lord in his temple seated on the throne with heavenly glory and seraphim, which means fiery ones, going around the throne with, with six wings that they're, they're flying and they're covering themselves and, they're, and they are proclaiming, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And Isaiah's first response is, woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. You don't see your sin clearly when you compare yourself to other people. But when you see, get even the briefest vision of the holiness of God Almighty, even the, the, the smallest glimpse of how holy he is, you recognize that we, we all fall short in many, many ways. Paul, Paul said to put off the weight as we're running this race, put off the weight and the sin that so easily besets you. And let me help you with that easily besetting sin. If you can't identify your own easily besetting sin, it's probably pride. Pride doesn't see itself. But this revelation of his sinfulness, of how sinful he is, God's end is not to condemn him. His end is one of the seraphim comes and he goes and he takes a, a coal from the altar of God and he burns his lips and he says, your sin has been atoned for. God has made a sacrifice for your sins and he's purified you. God's end for us, folks, is not that we be living as just sinners saved by grace. He wants our identity to be in what he did on our behalf, that he has atoned for us, he has forgiven us, he has purified us. It creates this new identity of heirs, favored sons and daughters, that makes you just want to love God. Point two, and this is my last point. Loving much. First, to love much, you must receive God's love. And then secondly, by expressing love to God. I want to talk about these acts of worship. There is a similar story in both Matthew and John about a woman. It's at a different time in his ministry. It's at a different place than the Pharisee's house. It's actually at the house of, of Simon uh, of the leper, uh, a leper that had been healed. And it's, we know for sure that it's Mary of Mary and Martha that makes this act of worship, but she comes in. It's the week before Jesus dies. And she pours out a bottle of oil, perfume, costly perfume at Jesus' feet. Matthew 26, 8, the, the disciples were indignant and said, why, why this waste? 
Why are people wasting their time and their energy on these extravagant acts of worship? Why are we having Gates of Glory Friday night where we just get together and we worship in a world of need and trouble? Shouldn't Christians be out there doing something? Why would we waste time just worshiping? Why would we just be giving our praise and our adoration to God? Why, why do people raise their hands or, or get down on their knees? Or, or why, the, why the displays of worship? Certainly we're above that. And Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, the poor you will always have with you. There's always needs. There's always needs. And he says this, wherever the gospel is preached, I want what this woman did told with the gospel. I want this to be a new part of the gospel. This is the response I am looking to to the gospel. I am freely laying my life down. I am all in. I am without thought of personal safety or what anybody's going to think. I'm going to hang naked on a cross, unashamed to associate myself with you. And this woman who broke in here with no opinion, no care of what anybody else was going to think, has poured out this extravagant offering. Wherever the gospel's preached, I want what she has done told. It's very similar to David, who is called the man after God's own heart. David is coming in. They've got the ark of God. The ark of God carried the very glory, the very presence of God, and and they're bringing the ark in. And David is celebrating before the Lord. He's dancing. He's, He's just beside himself because of God and who God is and and his wife, Michael, the daughter of Saul, despises this expression of worship. She judges him in her heart and criticizes him and David's response is this. It was before the Lord who chose me above your father and above all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord. Therefore, I will celebrate before the Lord and I may be more undignified than this in the future. (laughs) I want to encourage you to worship God without thought of what other people think, without thought of how it's going to look, whether it's going to be proper or not. Jesus is worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our sacrifice of praise and adoration. Expressing love to God in acts of worship where you're actually loving God directly. Not just, I'm loving his people, so I'm showing my love for him by loving people. Uh, Loving people is awesome. That's the second command. The first one is to love God himself. And then by expressing God in acts of worship, and then secondly, in practical life. It says that these women... They they throw this verse in here about these women who are supporting the ministry of the 12 out of their private means. And Mary Magdalene is mentioned and Susanna is mentioned and Joanna is mentioned. And these women are worshiping God, yes, in extravagant acts of worship, but they're giving out of their private means, they are supporting the, the 12. Do you ever wonder how they got by, how they ate I mean, it would make sense to us that Jesus would just multiply food whenever they needed to eat. I mean, when you're God, you can just multiply things. But God himself has chosen 
to be supported by these women. Remember Elijah? Elijah, the prophet of God, the man of God, he's prayed and the rain has stopped and there's a famine in the land and God says, go down by the, the Jordan River and I'm, it's not, the, it's not the Jordan River, it's somewhere else. And, and, and so he's there and the ravens bring food to him and he is fed by ravens. God could have done it directly, but he chose to have these birds bring food to Elijah. And then the, the brook dries up. And God says, go to the widow at Zarephath, and I will supply your needs through her. Tremendous humility that God would take the most broken of society, the most disempowered in that society, a female that lost her husband, has a family, and God says, I'm gonna provide for you through her. Do you know that God's strength is actually drawn to our weakness? So, just a few years, I guess it was last year, my daughter Anne um, married a guy named Josh Angel. My daughter married an angel. <laughs> and she, they asked me if I would do the uh, wedding message. I was, I was already walking her down, um, but they wanted me to, do, to, to preach to them. And as I always do with anybody that I'm marrying, I was like, you know, you give me the text, whatever text you choose, I will preach the wedding sermon from that text. Well, they chose the craziest, it was like they wanted to make my job impossible. They, I mean, when, you're, when, you're, when you choose a text, it's going to be, you know, like 1 Corinthians 13, or, or it's going to be Ephesians 5, or, or it's going to be uh, Ecclesiastes 4. I mean, these are, these are wedding scriptures. So here's the, here's the scripture that they have read at their wedding that I am supposed to develop a message around. It's about the widow's might. It's about the, the disciples and Jesus are watching people put money into the giving box and uh, the, the widow puts a mite in and Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them. For they all out of their surplus put into the offering. But she out of her poverty put in all that she had to live on. What does that have to do with a wedding? What's, got, what's that have to do with marriage? So here's what I said. Knowing Josh and Ann. I, there's two things in this text that, that I believe are true about these two. And one was that they wanted to be all in. They didn't want to do something for God. They wanted to be all in. They didn't want it to be easy. They wanted to do a hard thing. They wanted to give, not from the extra and just have a little religion added to their life. They wanted to be all in. They feel like they're called to be missionaries. And whatever little they are, whatever little they can bring, they want to, they want to sacrifice it's really a counter to the American spirit. I, I shouldn't say that because Americans are very good at sacrificing, but the, the, a culture of comfort, that let's, let's say that. It confronts a culture that oftentimes just wants comfort. So I talked about that. But the second thing was that they weren't doing it to be seen by people. 
This widow had no idea anybody was watching her. And anybody that did see her and saw the amount she was putting in would have thought nothing of it. Because they didn't know. They, they couldn't know the sacrifice she was making. But God knew. It took God to know what she was putting in and what the sacrifice was. And oftentimes, as a mom, almost everything you do is unseen and unrewarded by people. The prayers you pray, the burdens you carry, the diapers you change, the meals you make, the rooms you clean, oftentimes nobody is saying thank you. But Jesus wants you to know that he sees it. He sees your worship of him. He sees that you're doing it for, not just for your kids, but for him. And you've captured his heart. He wants you to know that. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come back up. And uh, we're gonna do a couple things. Why don't we do this one while they're coming up? If we could have every head bowed for just a moment. Maybe you are at church today. Maybe, maybe because it's Mother's Day and you came because your mom wanted you to or, or your grandma wanted to. But wh whatever reason, however you ended up in this place, Something more is happening in this service than just some songs and somebody speaking. The Bible says in Revelation 3.20, Jesus himself says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him. And maybe during this service, Jesus was speaking to you. He says, if anyone doesn't matter what you've done, what you've said, where you've been, what sins you have committed, however horrible or difficult, or maybe it's a, another sin of pride and prejudice and arrogance. He said, if anyone hears that knock and has the courage to open the door, I will come in. The Bible says he came to his own, his own received him not, but to as many as received him. To them he gave the power to become the children of God. Not, not orphans, the children of God, the heirs of God. Most hear the knock and say no. They keep going their own way. But maybe you're hearing that knock today and you want to open the door. You want to give your life to Christ. I've got your head bowed because this is between you and God. But somebody help me make this step. Somebody help me open my door. If that is you today, it would be my privilege to help you. If that's you, would you just raise your hand real high right now? I see that hand and I see that hand. God bless you. You can put those down. I'm looking around the bottom here. Anybody else by upraised hand down on the floor? Okay, I'm up in the balcony now. Anybody up in the balcony by upraised hand? You want to open your heart today to Christ. Okay. I'd like those that raise their hand to put your hand on your heart right now and pray something like this. Lord, I am coming home to you. I'm opening the door of my heart and of my life. I ask you to come in and wash me and cleanse me and make me your own. I repent of going my own way. God, I want to go your way. I receive now by faith your gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Could we stand together? Before we do the second thing, I want to sing a song together.